everybody. Welcome back to the Piano Star Masterclass, brought to you by Piano League. I'm your host, Brian Lin. During the live stream, you can ask us any question in the chat, and we'll do our best to answer them. You can also sign up to be a performer for these classes and get a chance to perform for our live audience. Today's guest teacher, Leanne Osterkamp, is a pre presidential scholar of the arts and a Steinway artist. Formerly adjunct faculty at Juilliard, she is currently the orchestra director, advanced piano director, and boys choir director at Reggie's Jesuit High School. She founded the Broken Wing Charity in 2019 to support breast cancer victims. Today, she'll be sharing with us the starting and finishing stages of practicing a new repertoire. Welcome to the show, Leanne. Hi, Brian. It's really nice to to be here today and talk with all of you. Uh, I wanted to kind of talk about some cool topics today, so I think we're going to have a lot of fun. I agree. I agree. So today's topic um, is obviously about practicing new repertoire, right? So my first question to you would be, um, why is it important that people know how to practice um, from beginning to end, um, the, the beginning and end stages of a, a new repertoire? Yeah, I think when we start learning pieces, um, you know, when we've just opened the new book that we've gotten in the mail or rented something from the library, um, and we're looking at a piece that we've never touched before, uh, that can be the trickiest part of knowing just where to start because it seems like such a big project. Um, and also kind of when we get towards the end stages of preparing for a concert, sometimes we can get too much in our heads. Sometimes we aren't quite sure how to feel 100% confident when we're going into that performance. So I think that those are kind of the most difficult times in learning to dissect and really know exactly how to practice. Um, so I think that that's kind of been the most valuable thing I've given to my students. So I'm excited to share that with all of you today. Um, and you know, uh, the thing that I kind of want to start off with is um, when I was younger and I was at a summer festival, um, I had the chance to take a few lessons and master classes with um, the professor Ari Vardi. Um, and back in the time, he said something that always kind of stuck with me, that the first time you ever play through a piece is really the most organic and real playing that you'll ever have. Um, and I kind of heard that resonating um, in my time at Juilliard, um, in my classes with David Duvall. I kept hearing that same idea that every time that you were to play something and you really had never heard it before, that first playthrough was really your most organic experience, which... It definitely doesn't feel like it because you're crashing through, you're trying to sight read, you're trying to figure out how to play. Um, so that's kind of where I want to start today is talking about, we open the book, we're looking at it for the first time. Uh, what are the things that we want to avoid doing and what are the things that we do want to do? Um, sure, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, no, I, I was just agree agreeing with you that it's, <laughs> uh, it's so go ahead and, and continue. <laughs> yeah. Um, I. When I ever I've uh, been teaching either high school or um, collegiate level, um, I used to teach a lot of beginning piano classes at Juilliard. Um, and the thing that um, even a lot of these incredible Juilliard musicians struggle with when they're playing a new instrument um, is they're not sure how to practice on that new instrument, right? So um, if some of you today are kind of new to piano, um, this is equally as applicable for you now as it would be um, if you've been studying for years and you've already been te uh, teaching professionally, uh, performing full time. Um, this idea of kind of how to start with a piece is just 100% the same. So you'll use this for your entire life. Um, and the number one thing that we want to avoid is being too hard on ourselves from the very beginning, um, especially if we're the kind of person that loves playing things correctly or we know we're making mistakes. There's a tendency from the very beginning to jump into the piece, start trying to correct stuff, trying to put in fingerings before we even have a flavor of it. And I want to say that I think the most important thing to do is before you start really getting into the nitty gritty practicing is to just plow through it, to try to play through the piece, you know, ignore your mistakes, do your best to just kind of sight read through it. And the reason this is so important is that you really get a flavor for what you're going to experience. It really helps you create and map a game plan for what you're going to do. And it doesn't matter whether you're playing a Clementi Sonatina or whether you're playing the from second piano concerto. Um, it's really kind of the same idea. You wanna see what is in this piece. It's kind of like a first reading of a book, if you will. So that's kind of where I wanna start is we're going to read through a piece, but then 
that's not enough, right? We can't just play through it and say, okay, we're still kind of lost. What do we want to do? So after you play through, here's kind of my stepping stone of how I like to break things down for my students and I even love to do for myself. Um, so today we're going to explore um, Beethoven's Sonatina in G major. Um, it's a really wonderful piece. We're just going to explore the first part of it. Um, so you'll end up seeing that come up on your screen. And right now we're just looking at the first page. Um, there's a little bit more of it. If you know this piece well, about a line more. Um, but this is a great place to start. <laughs> you can see I went crazy with the color coding for all of you at home because uh, it's kind of a nice, easy way to see what I'm talking about. So the first step that we want to do after just kind of playing through and experiencing the piece for the first time um, is to really think about, first of all, adjectives that you might have of what just came to your mind, what was sparked in your imagination. Um, I tend to like to just kind of write some of that down in a journal. Um, sometimes I'll write it right on the music. Maybe you experience the piece as very wistful. Maybe it was exciting. Maybe it was romantic, right? Just anything that comes to your mind, even if it's silly. Um, and the reason I love going for the adjectives to begin with is not only will it kind of help you explore articulation and character in the piece, but also what's fun is that when you revisit a piece years later, it may completely change or it might be exactly the same. Because I know that I've definitely lived with pieces for years, played them in multiple concerts. And when I've revisited my initial interpretations of a piece, um, sometimes it's amazing how a piece never changes, but sometimes it really, really does. So definitely record your first experiences of a piece because it's really important for you artistically to kind of see how you're going to grow with the piece. Uh, but the next thing that kind of is, is fun for everyone, and you don't have to really fully understand music theory yet, is just marking sections. And you might say, well, I don't know exactly how to analyze the structure of a piece yet. That's totally fine. These sections are meant for you. And you'll find that you'll end up teaching yourself a lot of what you'll learn in later music theory classes just by your own initial instinct. So when you're looking at this page, um, if you can see kind of the purple brackets, I might be able to zoom in here a little bit more for some of you, because if you're like me, my eyes are not the greatest all the time. So here we go. So you can see how we have some purple brackets um, that are kind of at the beginning of the piece. The first thing you obviously want to look for is if you see kind of the double bar lines, repeat signs, anything that the composer is already telling that, hey, this is part of a bigger section, right? Because then the composer is at least giving you that leeway. Um, but the other thing that you may want to explore is if we go later in the piece, we'll see that we don't have double bar lines everywhere. Why would I mark a section here? Well, because it actually is exactly the same material as the beginning. So even if I was just exploring this piece for the first time, I'll probably recognize that, hey, I actually played that thing earlier, or maybe it sounds similar. So it's kind of a great place to start is saying what things sound the same, what things sound a little bit different, where does it feel like the character changes, right? So going back to all the adjectives that we wrote when we first played through, maybe the adjectives are how we want to bracket, you know, a happy section versus a sad section, which later we might realize is a change in the key. So all of these things, aren't gonna only help us to kind of visualize the sections of the piece, but this is gonna be really crucial for us later when we're memorizing the piece. Um, I find that I bracket my pieces all the time because what it does is it helps me really kind of have some mental images in my head about the, the smaller and larger sections so that when I'm playing by memory in a concert, I can kind of latch onto those as kind of safety points, making me feel a little bit less nervous if it's a very difficult piece. And, you know, we're all humans. So if we end up having a memory slip, sometimes having a little bit more of an outline of the piece can really help you to find a new place to start. Um, all those wonderful things that we're going to need later towards the end learning part. So that's kind of my first suggestion is looking for those brackets. And again, not being overly picky about if they're academic or not, just really what you feel are major sections. And then the next part is kind of one of my favorites is that maybe kind of read through the piece again, but this time, instead of stopping and starting everywhere, I want you to make note of where you can play through completely easily already. Maybe there's parts and measures that are 100% sight readable for you. 
and then parts that maybe are impossible. Like you can't even get through the whole measure. You just got to skip it. And what's great about that, I like to do it kind of a little bit of a fun way. I try to put stars and smiley faces on mine um, just to kind of be like, hey, I can do it. Or, hey, that's a, that's a place I want to revisit. Um, and what's really important about that is it's going to help you map where you need to start with the piece. It's also going to help save you time later. And it's going to help you go back and look at the sections. So, for example, I have a smiley face right at the beginning. Why? Because I'm kind of noticing, ah, oh, it's all in the same place. For some reason, that was really easy to sight read. I'm noticing that there's a lot more eighth notes and runs wherever I put stars. So that's interesting. And I'm noticing, hey, I have a smiley face again <laughs> when it repeats. So that already is helping me mentally before I even really get into the detailed practicing of the piece, kind of realize that, hey, the structure is really holding true for me. That repeat is really a, a repetition of an earlier section. And I know that when I go back to that, that's going to save me practice time. Because if I practiced it once, I don't need to practice it again. So that's, that's kind of a bonus. I'm going to learn this piece a lot faster. And then that's kind of what you want to explore is after you go through and just put in stars, smiley faces, whatever is kind of fun for you, you want to go back and say, why is that hard? And that's kind of the part that you want to engage with your teacher. But it's also important to kind of think about it yourself, because the ultimate goal with piano or any instrument is to be able to teach yourself at some point. Right. So if you can start already kind of deciding for yourself, is it that the fingering is a little bit too hard for me right now? Is it that, you know, when I'm looking at my first star that I have in the piece, I'm noticing that there's some grace notes. You can kind of see in the orange that I did for you, um, throwing more colors at you, that I kind of made some notes about maybe some of the things that made it tricky to sight read for, for the student, right? The grace notes maybe were a little bit odd. Maybe I haven't worked on that technique yet. Um, you can see that there's some arrows, meaning that the hands jump quite a bit. So... In other parts where we have kind of the green stuff, oh, well, notes stay the same. Our hand position isn't moving too much. But if we're leaping everywhere and the fingerings are all changing and there's a lot of articulations, those are kinds of things that might trip us up. And the more that we go through and we look for stars and smiley faces, uh, a lot of times that'll show you that there's one or two very specific things that are hard about a piece for you. Um, and so I kind of find this as a really optimistic way of practicing because it's really easy for us as musicians to be hard on ourselves, especially at a beginning stage of a piece and get frustrated. And how many times did you just say, hey, I'm not going to learn this. It's too hard. It's too hard. And instead, what this is doing is it's showing you the whole piece isn't hard. It's just that maybe one or two techniques in the piece are hard. So that's going to be a really fun way for you and your teacher to practice and kind of isolate exactly what you want to work on with any given piece. Um, and so what's cool is that now that you've gone through all of these things and you can, get, of course, use any color you want, any markings you want, um, just by doing this, this is about a day's worth of work, maybe two days of work. Um, throughout the first week of learning, what you're really doing is you're going through, you're making sure that your kind of sections are about how you want. Maybe you're finding that there's mini sections within the bigger sections. Maybe you're finding really cool things that are easier than you thought. Maybe some things are harder. And then what's really fun is that that's going to help give you your game plan for how you're going to start practicing the piece. So here's a couple of uh, more specific practice things aside from the notation that you can kind of tackle these notations with. So the first thing that we're all going to have a tendency to do when we have a hard section is uh, we're going to want to play hands separately. Um, and Brian, you can go ahead and put my screen back on because I don't want to over <laughs> overdo the colors and the notation with everyone. Um, thank you. Is that we don't want to play hands separate right off the bat. It's always a tendency that we want to just memorize the left hand and memorize the right hand and then try to put everything together. And what happens when we do that is that we end up creating three times as much work because we end up learning three separate pieces. So when you're just starting a piece, in my opinion, I think the only really important use of hand separate is fingering. So after you go through the piece, take the time, find out what the best fingering is using each hand separately. But 
I think that it's really important from the beginning to focus on playing hands together because a lot of times you'll find that your balance just between the two hands, how your core is engaged when you're sitting on the bench and just the way that your brain is paying attention to the dynamic between the two hands is going to really just be there from the beginning. And what do I mean by dynamic? Well, the human brain can only focus on one thing at a time right? Even though we can maybe be thinking about something in the back of our minds, we can't actively think about two things exactly at the same time. So when we're playing the piano, what we're really doing is deciding which hand right at this split second am I paying attention to and which one can I kind of rely more on my muscle memory to play. And so by working hands together from the very beginning, what you're doing is you're kind of through a trial and error, figuring out which hand you want to focus on at any time. So that's another thing that maybe a little bit more advanced students might want to notate is if you can kind of tell which hand you're going to want to pay attention to. Um, some students find it helpful to kind of just make a note of that with a little check or something. Um, but basically, after you go through and you make the major notations, now we're talking about go through slowly, play hands together, try out some or, um, for getting the main gist of the piece, but only play hands separate to get fingerings. Don't try to just learn the piece all left hand, all right hand. Then if you get to a place that's just like really dense, like a lot of you are knowing what I'm talking about, like with these Brahms pizzas, like the Intermezzi, um, with some Chopin ballades, with anything that has just these massive, massive chords, um, especially with Rachmaninoff, when you get into more of our Russian composers, um, the thing that I always tell students to do if this is a new type of music for you to read is always think about reading your left hand, right hand play. So even if we go back to our Beethoven for a second, I can kind of describe what I mean by this kind of reading style. Um, so let's say that as we're going through the Beethoven, we're looking for some of our more chordal areas. So let's say here at the very end of the piece, this is kind of a new style of reading when we've been doing more broken chords, things like that. And we get to the end of the piece and all of a sudden we have chords that are played together, right? Um, especially a lot of very beginner students um, have a hard time reading three notes at once. And that's understandable. If you've been playing an instrument that's like trumpet or violin and you're reading one note at a time, right? You, you're used to just kind of playing one and then go on to the next one. So what you want to do with your brain is kind of trick it into reading that way, um, but just at a very fast speed. So when we're looking at the chord here at the end, instead of trying to read three notes at the same time, which will often end up in us playing at least one of the notes may be wrong, always read left hand, right hand play. So I would read the G in the left hand here at the very end in the last three measures. Then I would read BG very quickly in the right hand, and when I mean read, I'm placing my hands there quietly. So I'm placing my left hand on the G, placing my right hand, and then playing. So it's kind of like you're reading from bottom to top. I, some students find that useful, or top to bottom. And you're kind of reading three notes very quickly, and then play. So that's a great kind of way and strategy. Um, can't, unfortunately, go into too much depth with that today. Um, but for any chordal reading, um, that's a really important skill to have when you're going through really dense things. And since we're talking about reading, uh, uh, I want to show. Uh, I want to ask a question from yeah, actually please. from one of our audience, uh, and I'll, I'll put that on the screen too, so you can see. So um, he asked. Oh, I guess the screen doesn't show. But anyways, um, he asked when you encounter a problem with, let's say, a particular scale mm -hmm. in a particular place of the piece. Do you try to fix that scale and then go on to reading, or? Uh, to reading more or is it better to just continue reading? So basically, do you stop and fix that first or do you go on and read the rest first? I yeah. imagine this. If it's in one of the first one or two times that you're reading, I would say just kind of make a mental note that you're going to go back, right? Just mark that. Um, and then that's definitely kind of that second stage that we're talking about of maybe you messed up the scale the first time. So you put a star there or something just to kind of say, hey, I couldn't read through that perfectly, right? Um, and then what you might find is maybe all the scale passages are where you're struggling, right? And that's really not um, super uncommon because scales are hard to do with fingerings a lot of times, especially when composers throw in sharps and flats and all that fun stuff. Um, so that might be the first thing that you wanna tackle in the piece is go back and look at the scales, put in the fingerings, um, and then bam. That way the second time that you read through it, right, it's gonna be a lot better. But 
it's just important in the first one or two times that you're reading through the piece that you don't immediately lose the flow or the structure of the piece um, just to fix the scale because you know that you can fix the scale. Um, so that'll kind of be the step after you go through and make your first initial markings. Got it. Great. Cool. Yeah. And so basically, um, we're going to jump kind of to more what we do at the end of the piece. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I want to just also emphasize that, um, and, and this is a great I, uh, segue with that idea of scales, right? Is that not every single measure or every single note of a piece needs extreme hours of work, right? Sometimes we'll notice that places like the scales will take most of the work and then other pieces, places a piece will not be too hard. Um, and that's really important to think about, especially if piano is not your full-time career, right? Maybe you have a job on the side, maybe you do something else. And so you don't have the time to spend, you know, eight hours a day playing the piano. Spend your time focusing on you know, one or two technical elements in a piece at the very beginning. And you'll find that you'll go from sight reading to really kind of playing through it at a much faster level because you're targeting the areas that need the work, not just trying to start at the beginning and then stopping every time you make a mistake. Because if we do that, we kind of only learn the first three measures and then we keep getting stuck and we never really get the idea of how to flow through the piece. And you don't have to always start at the beginning. That's the other big, big message to take away from this. We can actually start learning a piece at the end. We can start in the middle. We can just target specific types of techniques. So that's really why the markings that I talked about, um, I put so much emphasis on, is that the markings that you put in with the smileys and the stars and whatever you want to do um, are just really important in helping you know how you want to tackle that piece on that second stage when you're actually starting to get into that detailed work. Um, so the kind of last thing, and this won't take as long um, because I think that this is more of a mental component, um, but how do we really practice and prepare for a concert, right? So we've spent all of the hours, all the months, weeks, whatever we've had to kind of work on a piece. And we're maybe in the week or two before a performance. So this is now a kind of different element of practicing of how do we really polish it and get it ready to feel comfortable on the stage. Um, I think the most important thing to do practice wise is to practice performing. Um, some of my greatest mentors, um, Stecker and Horowitz, um, they really talked about how the stage was the best teacher. Um, and when I was younger, I used to just kind of be fearless and I didn't have that much you're going on stage, but I also didn't really play the big hour and a half programs until I got more into my college level. Um, and they really encouraged me to try to perform as much as possible, even if I felt like I was totally not ready. Um, and it's kind of hard because you have to learn to not have an ego as a musician. Instead, it's really about accepting that music is a lifelong learning process, right? So you have to be able to play in front of colleagues or peers or your family or your friends and be willing to make those mistakes because it'll actually save you a lot of time in your practicing and it'll make you more confident for when, you know, the stakes are a lot higher. Maybe you're doing a competition or a public performance or a recording. So uh, the number one thing that you want to do, I think, before you perform for your friends or your family or anyone that kind of gives you that little bit of extra stress is I want you to write down a list. Um, and I have all of my advanced piano students do this of things that you think will go well and things that you think will not go well. Um, and what's really fascinating is that a lot of times you kind of have a 50 50 list. Um, you'll find that most of the things you thought would go well did. Um, a lot of the things that you thought wouldn't go well didn't, but there's always kind of a few interesting ones where sometimes you're surprised something went really, really well that you thought was going to be horrible. Maybe you thought your pedaling wasn't quite good yet, and you actually found that when you were performing, it kind of came together because you've been practicing that a lot lately. Maybe you have been focusing so much on pedaling that you forgot about practicing this one really hard section, and that kind of just all of a sudden didn't work when you tried to perform it. Um, I one time actually forgot, I was so nervous about a program that I forgot about a piece I was playing on the program and I didn't remember until I was on stage and realized that my Mendelssohn piece was next in the program. And I was like, wow, I was so worried about everything else that I forgot to practice this. And it went fine, but it was a lesson to me at that moment that, you know, sometimes you need to just take a step back and make sure that you're thinking about the, the bigger picture instead of just focusing on the parts that you think are hard. 
Um, the biggest thing too is that when you're preparing for a concert, alternate the days that you do really detailed work and days that you do broad work. Um, it's really easy to get so concerned about one measure or about one passage or about one piece um, that you end up kind of forgetting about the broader musical purpose, right? You'll spend the whole concert freaking out about one measure instead of enjoying the whole entire piece like you did the first time you ever played through the piece. Um, so it's important to have days where you sometimes just play through your whole program um, and other and you just maybe do that three times throughout the day, once in the morning, once at lunch, once at dinner. Um, and then other times you might want to spend, you know, four hours on two lines and that's OK. Um, but just make sure that you're alternating that right before you perform so that you're not getting too much in your head about specific sections in a piece. Um, and I think that that's kind of a bigger principle, too, is that um, once you start getting closer to the performance, it's about kind of accepting that you can't change everything one day before the performance. Um, and, you know, I, I had a wonderful mentor that used to be practicing um, backstage right before the concerts that we would do together. And he said, um, you don't want to peak too soon. <laughs> and he was literally <laughs> practicing five minutes before the concert. Um, and you know, it was always fun to watch him do that because I have the very opposite approach to where um, right before I go on stage, I might warm up with other pieces. I'm not even playing in the concert, um, just play through fun things that I've always done. Um, but the idea is really about um, kind of accepting that you're going to grow with your pieces for your whole life. Just like I was talking about earlier with, you know, writing down adjectives, see how things change over time. Um, and when you really have that perspective that these pieces are you know, lifelong friends that you're going to keep revisiting. Um, it, it really takes pressure off that nothing has to be absolutely perfect at that exact moment because it can't be. Um, it's something that you're going to live with. So kind of accept that this is a really cool performance of wherever your piece is at that moment. Um, and just kind of accepting that for yourself. Um, and kind of my last comment, because I want to make sure that if there were any questions, we get time for that. Um, is especially for more advanced students are watching. Um, I've always found that when you're preparing for competitions or anything, it's really important to constantly mix things up. Um, if you're sports players, you do this all the time anyway, right? You don't, if you're like a cross country runner, you don't just run the same exact distance every day. Um, you know, you try to work on your sprints, you try to work on your long game, you try to work on all the little things, maybe strength training, cardio. It's the same thing with piano. You want to try to mix it up. So if I'm preparing for a very high stakes concert or competition, I try to mix it up where I'll start in completely random places in the piece. Um, sometimes I would wake myself up in the middle of the night to try to just like wake up groggy and try to play through it and see what happens. Um, sometimes I would, you know, try to do it midday when I just was completely not warmed up. So I would do it when I was completely warmed up. I would do it on my friend's pianos on keyboards. Um, so the idea is just to try to play your repertoire in many crazy ways as possible um, to just kind of get yourself out of your head and accept that you can do it anywhere, anytime. Very, very wonderful, wonderful advice. And I, I think the waking up in the middle of the night is is a, uh, is a very, very new. <laughs> I think it's the first time I've heard, I've heard someone did that. But I'm, yeah, I I'm had glad a teacher that recommended it. And she said, you should be able to wake up and play this in your sleep. And I was like, okay, I'll try. <laughs> did, you, did you set an alarm or, or what, what did you do that on on, on purpose I just kind of like, would, like if i woke up to get a drink of water i'd just kind of go and, and try to play it you know? <laughs> wow i'll 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 see i'll see if i can tell my students to do that if, if their parents <laughs> don't get angry at me <laughs> yeah, with the headphones for that right 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 anyways yeah i don't think uh we have uh any any questions any more questions but um right. You know, just just uh, people thinking that it's a uh, wonderful advice that you've given. So, very right. very good. And and it's um, it's already eight thirty. So it's we're right, right on time uh, for our uh, performer coming Perfect. up. And I, I I see him in backstage. So I'll bring him in. Uh, his name is Blake. Great. So there we go. Hi, Hi. Blake. Hi. Hi. Okay. Uh, Blake, where where are you right now? What uh city are you in? New York. Huh? New York. <laughs> I couldn't really hear, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> anyways, I think um uh you are you are from New York, right, Blake? Yeah. 
great, great. So um, why don't you, uh, why don't you and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Leanne, uh, well, <laughs> well, why don't I leave it up to you guys? Great. How are you doing today, Blake? Good. Do you love piano? Yeah. I love piano too. What are you going to play for me today, Blake? Rock. That sounds so exciting. Why don't you go ahead and play for me whenever you're ready? So terrific, Blake. That was so wonderful. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about the composer and about these pieces, because these are such cool pieces. Do you know where the composer lived? So he lived in Germany. Okay, so he was a German composer, um, which is kind of fun, because we have a lot of other German composers that we play all the time. Right. So there's lots of famous uh, German composers that we know, like Mendelssohn and Schumann and Liszt and all these other composers that I'm sure that you either play or going to play. And what's so cool about all of these composers is that in the time that they were alive, they all loved to work on music together. So what's cool is that this guy actually studied with Mendelssohn and Liszt and Schumann. Um, so he has a lot of stuff to learn from them that he decided he wanted to put into his own music. Um, so it's kind of fun because the more music we learn, we get to kind of see how composers learn from each other, what stuff all they, they have in common, and lots of really cool stuff. So uh, the cool thing about this piece is that, do you know what a gavotte is? Let's start with the fourth movement. So the second piece that you played, do you know what a gavotte is? A dance. It is a dance. Good job. Yeah, exactly. And I really love the dance feel that you had. It was so peppy. It was really exciting. I really loved how you made a big contrast in that middle section too. Your opening section was really exciting. And then in that middle section, I could tell that you were just really enjoying that different character that it had. 
How would you describe the different characters in the piece? Like, would you say it's happy, sad, exciting? Like, what would you describe the piece as? Um, exciting. It is, yeah. Do you think that it ever changes in the piece? Like, what other adjectives would you use? Or like, descriptive words. Does it get sad? Does it get... Like, it's very sunny and then it starts raining and then it's Oh, that's a great description. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I thought that you did that super well. And because you did that super well, I think you can make it more exciting by not giving away those really cool differences that you're doing. So in your piece, when you have that end of that first like sunny, exciting section, at the very end, before you go into that really beautiful kind of more rainy section, you kind of started giving away that you were gonna get rainy. So it'd be, it might be cool if, to make sure that like when we do these sections, we don't give away the surprise too soon, right? So can you try playing your first section for me on this gavotte, on this fourth movement? And I want you to not give away that it's gonna get rainy at all. I just want you to be 100% happy, silly, sunny, and then stop right before you get to the rainy section. Okay, good, right there at the end, right where you were playing, right? That's where you started getting a little bit too rainy too soon. So at that last part, the dun da da ba 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 bum ba, right? You can slow down, but I want you to keep being happy and silly. So maybe try not adding pedal right there at the end. Maybe just kind of keep that silliness. Can you try that one more time? Uh -huh, good, can you make it a little bit more staccato and short? Try to make, make it sound like you're giggling on the piano. kind of kept that silliness so that when you go on to this next section where it kind of gets to be rainy right it's going to be more of a surprise to the audience because they didn't know that was coming so why don't we play this next section yeah keep going <laughs> good yeah exactly so do you do you see how kind of right there on that section we have a cool word it's called musette do you know what that instrument is so it's kind of like this cool bagpipe thing so it's this big instrument that they had in france a long time ago and when you blow into it it kind of sounds like kind of like a foghorn or something it's like a horn it's very silly sounding and what's cool is that when the composer wrote that word, he was trying to say he wants you to make it sound like that instrument. So that's a challenge for us as pianists, right? We have to make our instrument sound like a weird horn instrument. That's crazy, okay? But when you look at the music, do you see how many times your left hand plays that chord in the bottom? It has happens all the time, right? Your left hand doesn't move at all in that whole time that you're in that section. And what that's called is, that's a fancy word that we have for that, it's called drone. So D-R-O-N-E, it's a drone. So what that means is, is that the left hand's kind of creating this cool horn-like sound while the right hand makes that really beautiful melody that you make. So can you try starting at that middle section for me where it gets rainy? And I want you to stay nice and quiet, right? Because the dynamics are really super quiet. 
And I want you to bring out that left hand, make it sound like a drone, maybe make it a little bit louder. It's kind of a cool sound, try it for me. Super quiet, super quiet. Nice. Good. Now, see, that's a cool place, right? You just ended this really cool section. I want you to spend longer. I want you to think that the audience, they're going to be like, oh, he's done with the piece. We can start clapping because it was so good. And instead, you're going to stop and almost be done and then go, Nope, never mind. I'm going to play this new exciting section again. Okay, see if you can make us think that you're done, but then surprise us with coming back in with the exciting section. So, can you start somewhere in that middle section, the rainy section for us? And then try to wait as long as you can and then surprise us that we're coming back in with the exciting section. Did you feel that? Isn't that fun? Because that way you're kind of tricking the audience. They think that you're all done and then you surprise them. That was awesome. Good. Keep going for us. Let's start right there where you made that awesome transition. Like, so good. So right there where we stopped, okay? Do you see how it has the word crescendo under there? Do you know what that means? It means get louder. So not only are we excited, but we're going to get louder and louder, right? It's like when you steal the TV remote and then you push the volume up and it gets louder and louder, right? So it's really easy when we're playing exciting music like this to kind of get too loud too soon, right? And the piano can only get so loud. So what I want you to do is when you get to this section, even though we're excited, I want you to keep all the great energy you have, but I want you to stay quiet a little bit longer so that when you get to the very end of the piece and you see those Fs in your music, that means you're super loud, you're super forte. So I want you to save a little bit of the excitement. Can you try that one more time for us? That was doing so well. Save a little bit of volume. Ooh, good. Okay. Do you see any indication that we have to get softer at the end of the piece? No, right? So this is what's fun. This can be your big ending to your concert, right? So I want you to try playing that last line again, and I want you to stay loud and excited all the way to the very end. Try to make it the biggest ending you can make. Take a little bit more time on that last two measures. Dum bum ba ba bum ba. Try it for me. That was so good. I love the energy. Oh, that was awesome. Yes, that was so great. Cool. Nice. Good. 
So yeah, and the one last thing I want to talk about, right? You said the gavat is a dance, right? So that's kind of cool. We made a whole dance. If you, just for everyone that's kind of watching this masterclass out there, this composer wrote a lot of these serenades. He wrote five, actually. And all of these serenades have um, a bunch of smaller pieces in them. And what's pretty cool, right, is that in this first group of serenades, it kind of looks like um, the composer is going to make a bunch of kind of like a Baroque-like set of pieces, like Minuet, which is another dance, Gavotte, Prelude. But what's interesting is when you look at his other sets, he has everything from variations to etudes, polonaises, marches, scherzi, waltzes. So he kind of combined the Baroque idea of a suite, which is a collection of dance pieces, with more of the Romantic area, uh, era of kind of trying to use all these new styles that came out um, and make these cool collections. So what's really cool is that um, today, Blake is uh, showing us kind of more of his Baroque style things, which is really fun. Um, so it was a cool pairing. Um, but for all of you that are kind of looking for a new repertoire, uh, there's a lot of really cool things in all these serenades that exist. Cool, let's go back to the prelude, Blake. Can you start the prelude for us again? It was so beautiful. Good. So one of the first markings on this piece is it's called moderato. So it kind of sounds like our English word moderate, okay, which kind of means like middle, kind of balanced. Um, so I love the character that you have in this piece. What adjectives would you use for this piece, Blake? How would you describe it to us? Like, what's the story in this piece? Um, it's like, um, it's Yeah. Lively. Ooh, yeah, that's a good one. Lively. And what else? Calm. Calm. Good. Yeah, that's good. It's kind of, and, and I love that you kind of gave us those two words, right? It kind of, it's exciting and it's lively, but it's also calm. So it's, it kind of almost has this feeling of wanting to move forward and be excited but there's a lot of kind of calmness. The word for that might be kind of it's serene, right? That's, that's an awesome description, right? And the reason for that is because our right hand in this whole piece is, um, he's playing all these really beautiful, awesome 16th notes, right? It's this flutteringness in the right hand. Whereas, can you just play your left hand for us, Blake, from the beginning? Can you do the prelude for us? The left hand in the prelude? Very nice, Blake, yeah. So our melody is actually in the left hand, right? So that's what's so cool about this piece is usually when we're playing piano music, the melodies are in the right hand, but this time it's in the left hand. So that's really, really cool, right? So the goal is, right, is that all of that calmness you talked about, Blake, that's all in the left hand. And our right hand is what's making it sound lively, right, and exciting. So here's the thing. I want you to make it just as exciting as you did, but... I want you to play the piece slower because it has a slower tempo marking. Okay, can you play the piece a little bit slower but keep the same, all the same character you had? So try from the beginning and see if you can play the prelude a little bit slower for me. Let's see what happens. Let's go. 
even slower, Blake. Let's try one more time. So I want like dum ba 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 ba. That's kind of the speed. Uh huh. Come. Can you try it one more time? That was a lot better. Very good. Nice and slow. Good. Good. So yeah, you're kind of showing us it's hard when whenever you're performing on the spot to change the tempo, right? And that's something that we can all learn is it's tricky when we're playing something live sometimes to switch up the tempo because what it's showing us is he has a great motor memory of the piece, right? He has a great memory of it. Um, and so sometimes we have to kind of reimagine how we play a piece um, when we're kind of trying to change the tempo. Can you play it like, so I would say, Blake, we are playing it kind of like a beautiful butterfly speed. Can you play it like a turtle's playing it? Pretend a turtle's playing it. Play it that slow. Make it sound silly. Good. Going. Make it sound pretty. Make it sound pretty. Good. 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 Okay, now I want you to find a tempo that's in between the two. So I want you to pretend that you are a big bulldog playing it. So you know how when bulldogs walk, they kind of hobble down the street in the city? Okay, I want you to play it like a big dog. So he's not a turtle, but he's a little bit faster and he's still not super fast. He's not like the butterfly you were playing before. Go ahead. Right. Very nice. Was so good, Blake. Now can you do that again? At that, that was the perfect speed. I want you to be the bulldog, but I want it to be a pretty bulldog. Okay, so the bulldog's owner dressed the dog up in a pretty dress. So you have to make him sound nice and like a bulldog princess. Okay, try it again for me. Make it pretty, but that tempo. Blake. Good. So there's a part in here. Um, I think a lot of people that are watching would love to hear this. Um, there's a measure on your measure 16 and it says un poco slentando. Okay. Slentando is a word that we don't see all the time. That's kind of a weird word. Um, and it actually is a Portuguese word. Whoa. So now we're going to Portugal, right? So we have a composer who's from Germany and he's now kind of writing in Portuguese, which is kind of cool. And so um, for anyone that's kind of interested, uh, slentando is a Portuguese word for ralentando. So what that means is that in that measure, we're going to get kind of slower. So um, Blake, can you find that measure for me and play it for me? It's one that has all the writing over it and it has the like alligator closing its mouth. Measure 16. I see it. Do you see it? Cool. Can you play that for us? Good. 
good. That was a perfect ending section. The measure is one measure ahead of that. So it's on the third line. Can you see the third line there? Play that first measure on the third line for us. Yeah, perfect. Good, good. Uh -huh. Good, Blake, yeah, good job, you're almost done. So on that measure, what I want you to do, can you play that right hand and can you make it as dramatic as possible, okay? So I want you to imagine that your parents told you you can't have ice cream for a year. Scary, right? So I want you to play that measure like they, like you're like, no, I love ice cream. How dare you take that away from me, okay? So try that measure again, but I want you to come with that character. Good job, Blake. I know you, 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 you've you been working so hard for us. We, we're really appreciative that you spent all the time you did with us today. So yeah, that's really cool. So I want you to experiment, Blake, when you're kind of working on this prelude, seeing if you can kind of find that like slower animal, right? Like seeing if you can find that really, really beautiful character you have, but just maybe making it a little bit slower so that that way when you play this piece with the rest of the pieces in the serenade, it just sounds like a really cool mix of pieces, right? It's like when we watch, you know, Disney movies or we watch shows, we want to always kind of watch things that have a lot of contrast in it, right? Like lots of different things are happening. Um, and so the more that you can bring out these really cool characters and sections, then you can end up kind of making more contrast in all of our pieces. Cool. Well, good job, Blake. I really appreciate you playing for us today. Thank you. Thank you, Blake, for joining us again. I think I think this is your second time. You've made quite, quite some progress. Congratulations and uh, great job again. I hope to see you next time, Blake. Bye-bye. <laughs> Good job, Blake. <laughs> These little kids are so cute. They're Love so it. Cute. <laughs> so fun. Well, for uh, complete contrast, uh, we have uh, an, an, an uh, adult as our next uh, performer. His name is Alexander Knight, and uh, I believe he's joining us from California. So welcome, Alex. Hi, how are you doing? Great, Hi, how are you? Good, now careful now, you just accused me of being an adult. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, we'll see, <laughs> we'll see at the end of this. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll hand the stage to you guys. Terrific. Do you go by Alexander or Alex? Uh, Alexander. Alexander, okay, great. Uh, what are you playing for me today, Alexander? Uh, Chopin, A2, Opus 25, number two. Terrific. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. I'd love to hear it. Great. Um, can you hear the sound okay? Perfect. It's good? Mm -hmm.
wow, that I didn't expect that to happen ten times. <laughs> that is totally uh, fine. Wherever you go, my start. finger hurts a little bit. Can I just try again? Is that oh, okay? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry about that. That is that's the first time that's happened today. And that's exactly what master classes are for. Is we're going to explore maybe why that happened. Oh uh, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> sounds, yeah, it sounds so fantastic. So I'm excited to hear it again. Okay, thanks for giving me another shot. I really appreciate it. Of that. course. Yeah, let's hear it again. I, I really apologize. I. Uh, oh, you should, oh, you should apologize for having a memory slip. It happens to every single human being on the earth. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this thing. No, of course. Yeah. Um, so are you learning this as part of like more etudes? Like what's kind of your, con is this going to be part of a concert just for fun? Like what's kind of your context in learning this particular etude? Um, my teacher introduced me. We began... Uh, uh, I was admitted to McGill University this year. Oh, congratulations. As an undergrad, yeah. Uh, and my teacher, he is, um, you may know him, Jared Dunn. He was at Juilliard for mm -hmm. a bit. Uh, yeah. But he thought he would introduce me to Chopin Etudes to um, mm -hmm. build my character, he said. <laughs> <laughs> as it does for us all, yes. <laughs> and so he, he threatened to uh, to inflict tyranny on me if I didn't learn patience. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I chose a tempo that that I'm not happy with, but that he that that is um, at least um, soluble in terms of uh, phrasing and. and um, you mean you're not happy with because it was too slow, too fast. Too slow. It's you know you want to play it twice as fast. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Great. So yeah, uh, is this your first etude, or have you played others as well? Yeah, yeah. It's my first Chopin etude. Yeah. Oh, well, welcome to the club. Yes. <laughs> Chopin. I yeah, I did start learning the harp, the alien harp etude. And, oh, cool, uh, great. Yeah, yeah, so what's cool about, um, especially this Opus 25, so for people that don't know, this is the second, the Chopin row, uh, two different opuses of, um, or larger opuses of etudes, the Opus 10, um, and then the Opus 25. Um, so this is the second one um, in the second set. And what's cool is that uh, for any of my fellow music theory nerds out there, the first one um, he was referring to the Aeolian harp etude um, is in A flat major, and this one follows it directly, and it's in F minor. 
Um, so my fellow music theory nerds know that that is the relative minor. So uh, what's kind of cool is that when you perform these as a set, um, it's a really beautiful transition because the keys just really flow well together. Um, so Chopin knew what he was doing. He was he he really knew how to write these etudes. <laughs> um, cool. But uh, so Alexander, what do you know about this piece? Just kind of like to give us a context for how we're going to work on it. So like, do you know kind of the historical background? Like when in Chopin's life he wrote it? Why was he writing these etudes? Um, I know that he I know that he created these etudes independent of other teachers. They they're, yeah. they're sort of an they're they're nominal they're an anomaly. And they were they are not uh, necessarily conforming to the rigidity of of the way etudes were being written then. It's completely original. And I know that he was young. He was much younger. I don't know exactly. I don't, I don't think he was in Paris when he wrote this. He was in mm -hmm. Poland, wasn't he? Um, yeah. So it was kind of more towards the end of his life. Um, what what I find interesting is like he wrote his first set. And to your point, these were totally different because. Um, they weren't just kind of, you know, <laughs> what you were saying your teacher was going to uh, make you have to do all the charity, all the other stuff, right? <laughs> Chopin really kind of was like, well, let's make these um, beautiful independent pieces, right? Um, things that you could actually play um, and have complete musical merit as well as technical merit too. And it's not that other composers didn't have musical merit to their etudes. I don't want to imply that. Um, but, but these really are kind of um, going to that next level um, in the Romantic era. And what I love about this set um, is it was kind of composed um, in 1835-36, um, and that's basically almost the exact same time that the fantasy impromptu was written. Um, and whenever I hear this piece, or, or um, like, you know, I haven't actually performed this piece, but just kind of when I played through it a few times, um, it totally reminds me of the technique of the fantasy impromptu, um, which, you know, is one of my all-time favorite Chopin pieces. So... Um, it's kind of really fun to see that he was writing both simultaneously, which is kind of why Chopin wrote a lot of his pieces, is that he wanted to use these pieces specifically to kind of prepare you for some of his bigger works. Um, so, right, exactly. Yeah, so what's great is that, you know, when you play a piece like this, all of a sudden you're going to go to the Fantasy Impromptu and it'll be like, oh, I've already done that before, right? Um, if you've kind of uh, done some of the um, Opus 10, um, some of those things kind of appear in some of his ballads. It's it's just really cool to see how um, things line up. But I thought the dates on this one were pretty, pretty cool um, when I had kind of looked at it before. Um, great. So... Um, you were saying, first of all, the things that you kind of weren't happy with yet, um, because like I said, pieces are always a process, um, is you kind of want the tempo to be faster eventually. Um, and then you were also saying that you had uh, some pain in your hand. Wh where specifically is that? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, um, okay. Um, the pain, um, I practiced this four or five times this morning. I warmed up on the piano. I uh -huh. played it through a number of times. Uh, and then uh, when I was at the um, the ocean, I live uh, by the beach, uh, mm -hmm. right right in here on these knuckles here. Mm -hmm. And today, yeah, th um, it might be due to st either stretching or curling, probably curling, I guess. And when um, when I when I was unable to complete the etude and I had to re start, you know, uh, after the, the, you know, the end of the first page, uh, there was in my middle finger was like locking up. I'd say right under here. Yeah. yeah okay. And it like it just wasn't functioning. Probably the added stress of the uh, performing uh, mm -hmm. may have done something. I, I actually don't really know. It's cool. like my faculty isn't working for me at the moment. Or yeah. No. And you know sometimes things like that happen when we go for test performances. <laughs> or sometimes why first one is I was doing a list transcription in concert. Um, and it was at the very end of the whole performance. Um, and I literally got a Charlie horse in my arm. <laughs> and I never had that happen before. And I just couldn't even feel my hand and I just had to keep playing and somehow I made it through, but it happens, right? Like weird stuff happens because it's a very physical instrument. Um, you know, I tried to convince my gym teacher in high school that I should get gym credit for playing piano, but that didn't work. <laughs> so, um, I kind of have a couple ideas about why that may have happened. Um, and Great. I have a couple technical like loopholes, if you want to call it that, um, that I found kind of make this piece work really quickly um, that are kind of unexpected. So uh, what edition are you using? I'm curious. Uh, Ekir. Okay, cool. Um, so you got all the slurs in there and stuff like that, that you kind of see typically with the Beethoven score or no, the, Beethoven, the 
Chopin scores. Wow, I jumped all the way back to the beginning of my lecture. <laughs> so yeah. um, the thing that I always notice about Chopin that's kind of sneaky is that what we see on the page is not necessarily what we feel in our arms. So what that means is, is that, you know, he's, he's a master at being very detailed. If you look at any of his manuscripts, like everything is very refined, really beautiful. Um, and it kind of looks like, okay, this is how I'm supposed to be grouping my right hand, my left hand. This is how I'm supposed to be grouping my fingerings. Um, but sometimes our weight distribution and how we're actually dropping our hand and thinking about the music technically is very different than what we see on the page. And I'm going to kind of describe what I mean um, when we go through this. So um, when you're playing this piece, do you tend to think about it in two or in four? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the polyrhythm is is really difficult to yes. achieve. Is this what you're getting at? Um, it's partially, yeah. But just um, I think of it in terms of well, when I'm practicing right hand alone, I I think of it in terms of uh, uh, one two uh, one two three one two three one two three one two three. Great. And then when I'm adding the left hand, it's more like one two three four five six one two three four five six. Gotcha. Okay. So that I think is the first place that I can help a little bit. So what you're doing, and can you, um, just for our audience at home, can you over-exaggerate kind of those beats in the right hand, what you were just doing, the da-da-da-ba-ba-ba-ba? Just yeah, yeah definitely. Um, um, I, I can even um, describe it. If every beat uh, has a, a triplet. So yes. the triplet would be like this. One, two, three. Oh, sorry. One two three, 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 one two three. Yeah, exactly. So per measure, you're thinking about your right hand in four, right? Because there's four beats in a measure. So you're going one, two, three, four. Yeah, even though it's a simple time, I'm thinking of it in four. Yeah, I suppose. Your right hand is in four, and actually, um, when I was experimenting with this piece, um, that is the most comfortable technical way to play the right hand which is great okay so you're you're on to something by doing that but you were saying that you're counting your left hand in six correct one two three four um let's see um well the left hand is uh makes chord so one two three one two three exactly so it's it's written. Mm -hmm. because they make these uh and that the outline of the chords right so basically the left hand is written into, but what you were saying is to try to kind of get that fluidity in the piece, you actually are trying to think of the left hand in one, meaning you're trying to go left hand, first note, da ba 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 correct? So you're trying to kind of think about each measure being emphasized. Right, while while also trying to pedal uh, correctly. And everything else. All the things, right. All the things. So that I think is the first place that we kind of can get a little bit confused is that if you're thinking in four with your right hand and you're thinking in one with your left hand, musically that kind of works. But at the same time, that's gonna make us have a lot of um, tension in our hands trying to match up all the middle notes in between there, okay? So let's start first of all with your right hand, okay? So I like that you're thinking about it in four. I actually secretly think about it in four, but I play it in two, okay? And you're gonna see what I mean. So uh, can you play the first two measures way overemphasizing the beats, okay? So on every triplet, I just want you to overemphasize that first note in each triplet. And, not, and try to not do it by like pressing, but instead like just kind of like drop your arm like a dead squid to go for your ocean <laughs> earlier. You want um, me to ignore the piano dynamic and just, just yeah, no, no worries about dynamics. We're totally okay, just right, just right hand or yeah, just right hand. First two measures, really kind of just dropping your weight on the first of every triplet. Terrific. Okay, what I love about that is every single beginning of a triplet is a C, right? I know. Every single one is a C. So that's why Chopin is brilliant. Is we've just had that beautiful twisty turvy. Um, like kind of filigree in there, but every single downbeat is a C. And that's actually why we tend to want to play the right hand in four, right? Is because our ear latches onto that C. And what it's doing is it's actually allowing your hand to have an anchor point. So 
one of the things that I think may have happened to your middle finger when you were playing earlier is that um, I'm noticing that when you're playing, you have a really wonderful motion um, going horizontally on the keyboard, but I don't see a whole lot of motion going in and out towards the fallboard. Okay, so I want you to try just for fun, feeling like you can go in and out like as much as you want, thinking more about that motion and do the same thing for me. In the same place or do you want me to go yeah, to where? Yeah, We're measures. We're just gonna be super simple for right now and then you'll see how it can apply later. Okay, so if I understand correctly, sometimes the, the audio cuts out, that's why, yeah. I'm that's why I'm reiterating. You want me to go in and out with the right hand just from the beginning for the first few measures or? Yeah, so over exaggerating the emphasis on the triplets and then just focusing more on that in and out motion as well as just the really wonderful horizontal motion you have. Okay. Um, how far would you like me to go? Um, just two measures is great. Okay. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Terrific. So I think you can already see, right? It doesn't have to be the most major or large motion, but what you're doing is you're allowing your hand when you're stressed by thinking of that motion to keep relaxing and to rely more on your arm weight to navigate up and down the keyboard instead of your fingers. Does that make sense? Uh, I could feel when I went into the yeah. A flat and F at the, um, uh, at the end of measure two, I could feel the arm weight uh, point that you were making and it feels good. Good, now can you try all of that same kind of element, just dropping your weight um, but try it a lot faster. Just those two measures, right hand. Yeah. Good. Now what I noticed is that you forgot about your second and fourth beats in every measure. So I heard the accent on da 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 da. What I'm hoping for is I want you to still over exaggerate all those C's. So go da 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 da. Okay. Yeah. You got that. Uh huh. Let me do that. Wonderful. Ready? Try it one more time. Okay. Yeah, it's a little difficult. One second. It is. It is. Take a second. <laughs> Good. So what you're, the reason it's hard is that you're not used to dropping your weight on every triplet. So even though your ear is wonderful and you are hearing every single triplet, what's happening is that your arm is dropping your weight perfectly on the first beat, but then you're tensing and so you're not allowing yourself to drop on every beat. And that's why you're kind of getting locked up a bit. So the more that you can get, train yourself to kind of drop on each beat, you're gonna feel a lot more secure and get that speed. Go ahead and try it a couple more times. Okay, I'm gonna add the left hand in here. Cool. Good. So that's that's where we're going with the right hand. And I could you feel any difference there in that first couple measures? Mm. Yes, there was more. I felt more stability uh, yeah. because my arm was depending on this beat to be state. Uh, to yeah. da, da, da. Yes. Good. Now here's where the left hand trick is. So I um, am a pianist that actually loves um, stride and ragtime music. So I played a lot of the kind of more novelty piano music where you're literally jumping up and down on the keyboard the whole time. Um, and what I really found is that the key to when we do um, pieces like this Chopin piece is that it's not about keeping the triplets as they are. It's about learning that even though musically we're going to bring out, you're, you're totally correct musically on what we're doing with the left hand, but we're gonna physically be grouping those notes differently. So on this first measure in the left hand, I want you to start on that G, that second note, the second quarter note, and I want you to play that G, C, B flat, and that's actually your group. So you're just dropping your, it's almost like that's a slur. Okay. Good. Um, can you make that just so that it's like it, you're, you're doing a repetitive motion, just doing those three notes and kind of just feel like as though that's the whole rep repetition for the whole piece? Yeah, definitely. I turn my fan on. I just want to make sure that's not interfering with the sound. Yes? It's perfect. It's great. Great. Thank you. Good. Like, if that was, yes. If that was your left hand for the whole piece, wouldn't this be so easy? 
<laughs> right. uh, I probably wouldn't be here. I would be out performing. <laughs> exactly. Good. Now, I want you to do the same thing on the next group of three. So the G, C, F. So we're always starting from that highest note going to the lowest note. Good. So now I want you to group those two together, keeping that same grouping. So pretending like it goes G down, G down. Perfect. So did you feel like how relaxed that is? So the first time you were playing through um, a lot, I heard the bass notes and they were beautifully shaped, which is actually a very impressive feat. So that, that was a really wonderful thing you should be proud of, um, is I heard that your bass lines were making a beautiful counter melody to what you were doing in the right, right hand. But um, I saw that you were kind of sticking on those bass notes and to bring out um, those triplets and those chords, you were kind of um, holding with your pinky and then stretching and trying to play the top two. And what yeah. happens when that? Yeah, and what happens with that is that first of all, we don't actually need to hold on to our bass note um, because you you've already given it a beautiful sound and sonority, so it'll already have that. So holding okay. on to it doesn't really do much. Um, and when we hold on to it, what it does is it doesn't allow us to have that same resonance in that wrist motion of coming down because we're holding, right? So it causes us to do more of this motion instead of this motion, which is what's going to kind of give us that speed that we need in this piece. So trust that you've already done the hard work with those bass notes. They're going to come out. You're going to feel and hear that piece in two. But when we're playing, we're always actually thinking about going from the top note down. So we're actually regrouping the piece in our heads and in our scores, right? So the slurs are going to look a little bit different in our head. But because of the way that you're voicing, you're going to hear the slurs that Chopin wrote. So that's kind of my initial point that what we actually are playing is different from the grouping that Chopin wrote in. Okay. How do you feel about, um, uh, do, you, do you think that finger pedaling should be used uh, whenever necessary? Um, I, I, uh, um, sometimes this, the strat, it is a stretch, but what about finger pedaling? pedaling? Um, I think with this piece, um, it goes so fast that I've found that um, even using this motion, like you don't need to really hold on to that lower note to get that resonance. Um, one way that I, I don't really, let's see, so yes to finger pedaling, but with this speed, okay. you're gonna get that finger pedaling without holding the bass, if that makes yeah, sense. Sometimes, uh, may I call you Leanne? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Our Professor Oster. Oh, no, Leanne's fine. <laughs> uh, Leanne, yeah, because sometimes the left hand is like, there's like a 10th or an 11th that you have right. to span, and sometimes it's within an octave. Right. Uh, and I find one of the challenges in the left hand is to think, okay, I have, to, I have to hold down the, the finger pedaling now, and I don't need a pedal now, but then when it's larger ones, I have to make sure the pedal's down. So, mm. so yeah, when I'm finger pedaling, I'm preferring yeah. not to use a pedal, because there isn't pedaling markings in every in every phrase. In right, every I would say that with this piece, it's I would practice this piece completely um, without the pedal, but without worrying about finger pedal while you're learning the technical part. So whenever Very I'm nice. working on etudes, I kind of have to forget the beautiful musical part. Um, just for a little bit like obviously i play through and i kind of am thinking about the bigger goal musically um but when i'm really working on technical work um i tend to like to just kind of add in one element at a time so with this piece i would always actually go through the piece um just left hand this is one example i would actually do left hand alone working always going from top to bottom like i was talking about and kind of retraining my arm to feel that grouping and what you'll find is is that once you regroup and have that fluidity in your left hand, it'll give you the flexibility to know when you can finger pedal a little bit extra or when, and then what you can do with the pedaling. Um, I kind of like starting at the extremes. I, I start with too much pedal, like over pedaling. I try playing the piece without any pedal. And then I kind of go by degrees where I'll play it. Okay. It's still way too much pedal, but a little bit less, right? Like 75%. And then instead of 0% pedal, I'll go to like 5% pedal. And when I do that, I kind of find where I actually need pedal and where I don't. So it's kind of starting at the extremes and then kind of bringing it in. And you're going to find which sections you're like, you know what, from not playing it with any pedal at all, maybe there's a couple lines that I don't need pedal at all because it just sounds great. Um, and you might find that some pedals, some parts can really afford a lot of extra because of the voicing and the register. Um, 
So um, I think I know exactly which part you're talking about. Um, so for example, like on measure 42 going into 43, so we're kind of going back into like a new whole section, right? Um, for me, like I have an incredibly small hand, so I never can really <laughs> rely on finger, finger pedal. I either have to just rely solely on the speed. And at that point, I would just add just a touch of pedal on that low G so that I can kind of feel that resolution to the next section. But I wouldn't right. thing. And I wouldn't try to finger pedal and be a hero because quite honestly, my hand can't do that. <laughs> so what I'd love is if you want to try, so now that we kind of worked on like regrouping, see if like when you're just starting this piece, right? If you're think the, the kind of main takeaways are, you know, dropping and feeling those repetitive C's, right? That's kind of your anchor for your right hand to help with that polyrhythm. Um, and then kind of focus on regrouping that left hand can because what you'll find is when you aren't stretching it's going to make it feel like you can play in any tempo it's the stretching that always creates that tension and then keeps us from playing fast great um i noticed that our uh half an hour is is sort of running to an end yes. and i was wondering yeah. if I, do i have if may i put insert one more question oh absolutely please yeah uh, I uh, first of all, thank you. I appreciate what you've told me, and it'll it'll be hours of me practicing, which nobody wants to watch. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be implementing that. Maybe I'll send you a message oh, later. Yeah, you know. Know. But I, what I wanted to ask was, did if you had any uh, comments on interpretation in terms of uh, dynamics, phrasing, um, uh, that in terms of the yeah the interpretation. If, yeah, if absolutely. Um, I think that the thing that's that's tricky about Chopin, or at least that I've always struggled with, is that um, it, scholars kind of disagree on the performance style of Chopin in many different ways. Um, a lot of people talk about how Chopin himself was such a quiet man, and um, some scholars believe that, like you know, he always practiced literally with like mattresses on his piano um, to just always have like a very soft, very delicate sound which I struggle with when I play some of his pieces like the etudes or the ballades, because some of the sections, you know, they're just, especially like if you're doing the first ballad, they're just so exciting and full. And especially on, you know, Steinways and uh, in concert halls, you just really want to be more virtuosic with it. Right. Um, so I think that um, you kind of have to make that distinction for yourself of what kind of artist you're going to be when you're playing Chopin. If you want to kind of, um, try to keep the style of um, the one scholar that's basically saying the pieces should never really go beyond a forte or a mezzo forte, or if you really kind of want to adapt it to more of the common okay. performance practice. Um, Would you say that my, uh, my current today's interpretation leans more on the side of, of um, um, sort of caution or on the side of I would say that just because um, it's not at the tempo you want yet, it sounded a lot more of that delicate, refined style, which was really nice. Like I didn't. I think, I think that's also indicative of my care. Who me? I tend mm -hmm. to be uh, more timid than assertive, and I I have to fill in the shoes of forte. That's a little hard for me. Challenging. Well, then then this may be the perfect like composer for you to kind of get into in that style, right? And yet that might uh, make you want to research a little bit more about studies that have been done about Chopin in that style, because there's a lot of papers that support evidence to do that. Um, and the other kind of characteristic, um, we kind of end with this, is that um, a lot of people talk about, you know, the romantic style of piano playing was very free. Um, you know, it wasn't so uh, classical in the sense of that you could really add a lot more interpretation in terms of rubato and you could add a lot more um, even ornamentation to some degree. Like I had a couple of um, teachers that would encourage me to even ornament like the Bersus of Chopin. Um, and so there are some studies you can look at of like different ways to ornament um, romantic music. Um, some people are just very hardcore to the score, right? Especially okay. competing. Um, so I felt that you had a really beautiful balance and I could tell that you were bringing it out in a more characteristic way of what you're saying your, your own artistry is. Yeah, it, it, um, if I'm completely honest with you, at the very, at the apex of the piece, you know, where it goes, uh, uh, that wonderful descending yeah. chromatic scale, I am thinking I need to hold back because this is a quiet, like, gust, gust of wind and I'm trying not to be too... Yeah. 
I think that that's like oh. what people go into, right? I tend to be the more like gusto, but I think that you can still achieve that in the style that you're going for, right? You can have that internal struggle. It doesn't have to be just so extra, right? You don't have to like share with the world, but like, you know, this is the moment. Um, okay. yeah, no, I could tell that that was the climax of the piece. I think the more comfortable you are with the left hand in this new grouping, the more okay. flexibility that will give you to have that refinement in interpretation in the right hand. Great, thank you. You've given me a bunch of new ideas for me to explore. And uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed your performance. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to just thank you again, uh, Alex uh, Alexander, and uh, thank you for joining thank you for us. Having on, me. Uh, hope to see you again. Yeah. Hope, hope to see you again too. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Great. How much wow. fun? That was oh. fun. I, I always learn so much uh, oh. from watching our uh, weekly masterclasses and, and not only, you know, on the topic, but also on, uh, you know, just watching how each expert, um, experts like you teach. Uh, it, it's really uh, eye-opening. So I uh, thank you again for sharing your wisdom and, and joining us. Well, thank you so much, Brian. It was really fun. <laughs> Great. Okay, so um, I want to tell our audience, again, if uh, this masterclass happens every Tuesday, if you want to be a performer, you can go to our website, thepianoly.com slash masterclass. And you can follow us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And of course, if we have Chinese fans, we have uh, WeChat as well. So thank you so much, and we'll see you um, next Tuesday. Have a wonderful evening.